Beautiful. Well, maybe we'll just get started with some of the intro stuff while we wait for people to show up. Um, and I'll just start off by sharing. My name is Susie Spickle, and I am the Community Programs Director and a Naturalist here at the Harris Center. And I'll be kind of uh, facilitating tonight to ask a naturalist. And before we introduce everybody else, I'm going to turn it over to Miles, who will introduce himself and tell us a little bit about our Zoom rules. Hi, everybody. I'm Miles. I'm the office manager at the Harris Center. Enjoy the program. We've had a lot of submissions, some last minute submissions, and uh, we tried to go over as many as we could. So enjoy the program tonight. Thanks, Miles. That was great. And now I'm going to just ask our panelists to introduce themselves. So I think I'll start with Brett, if you want to share who you are and, and what your specialty is. Hi, everyone. I'm Brett Thielen. I'm the science director at the Harris Center. And I tend to answer questions about amphibians at Ask a Naturalist. Yay, thanks, Brett. And how about Karen Siever? Why don't you tell us about yourself and where your area of expertise lie? Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm an ecologist at the Harris Center, and um, I try to answer questions about plants and water and a bunch of different things in this forum. But thanks for all for being here tonight. Okay, thanks, Karen. And Eric Masterson, tell us about yourself and what you'll be discussing this evening. Hi, folks. I'm Eric Masterson. I'm the land program manager at the Harris Center, and I focus on birds. Yay. And Jenna, yippee, I'm glad you're here. We were, we were a little worried because we need you. What's your it's, specialty? It's been a busy day, I know. Um, I am a teacher naturalist at the Harris Center, and my specialty is generally things related to insects. Here, um, tonight, we have a great set of mysteries lined up, and we're about to share it with you. So here we go. Let's see what our first question is. Okay. What bird used this delicate backyard nest? It's two and a half inches in diameter and one inch deep. I found it near a large Norway maple tree and also near a large zebra grass, boxwoods, and common rose bush. I live in Jackery. Thank you from Nancy. And that was submitted this past July. So of course, since this seems like a bird question, I'll turn it over to Eric. Eric, what, did, what can you tell us about this sweet little nest? Well, the first thing I would say is for folks who find nests, the, the, you know, what you're trying to do is narrow it down to the, the, uh, the suspect. And, you know, al although there's almost 200 species breed in New Hampshire, there's really very few that are going to breed in your, in your backyard and especially close to, to um, a house. And so really your candidates are few and far between. And of those candidates, many of them will be hole nesters. So it's a bird that breeds close to a house that breeds in a cup nest. And so of that size, you're really only looking at a few, maybe um, chipping sparrow or cardinal or um, song sparrow. There's really very few. This is a chipping sparrow, I think. You can never be certain, but I'm pretty sure this is a chipping sparrow. They're a flimsy nest, the size is right. Um, they're just, they're, the description um, in Birds of North America is an, a nest that's so flimsy that you can actually see light through it. And that fits the bill. It's usually made of pretty fine um, grass fibers and it's lined, and I think I can see this in the photograph, very often lined with horse hair. It's one of the telltale signs of chipping sparrow nests. And they're built entirely by the female. This is a nest that's built by the female. And very often they're in um, conifers. So if you have a backyard spruce or something like that, very often these, these nests are found in, in conifers. And they build a rim first and then the cup. Uh, they build a rim first uh, attached to, to the um, substrate and then, and then the cup afterwards. So I think this is a chipping sparrow. And it's, again, one of very few birds that you get great breeding in a cup-shaped nest that size in your backyard. And, and you found this on the ground. So my, my assumption is it fell out of a tree because there are some, mainly thrushes and some warbler species that breed on the ground in cup-shaped nests, but I don't think this is one of those. Well, thank you, Eric. That was really interesting. Um, I have a quick question for you, a kind of follow-up, but the nest is so small. It looks like it's just in a little like a uh, tea dish or something. I'm just wondering how small must the eggs be? Well, they can, they can have th three or four eggs. And so <clears throat> that a nest is probably about two and a half inches across. Well, that's exactly what she says, two and a half inches in diameter. So 
the eggs are a quarter, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not entirely certain, but something like a quarter inch on, they're really small. Oh, so you've got a three or four in that nest. That's so charming. I love it. Thank you so much. And I love that it's lined in horse hair or animal fur. Cozy. It's, it might be flimsy, but it looks pretty cozy to me. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Okay, let's see what our next question is. Um, this is an old tree in our neighborhood, and I'm curious about the indentations on the area where the bark has fallen away. Maybe they were made by a bear or a woodpecker, or who knows? I'm hoping one of your naturalists would know. I have seen both pileated woodpeckers and bears around here. Yesterday, I took the following photo, that's the next slide, of a yearling bear still shedding its um, fur, meandering through the woods next door. Many thanks from Sue. So um, for this one, this will require both Eric and myself. I forgot to mention that my area of expertise is mammals. Let's take a closer look at what Sue sent in so we can see if we can really sleuth out what it looks like. First of all, you can see the bear um, in the leafy picture. Um, and as Sue noticed, it's still shedding um, its fur. And I look at these little, I look at the marks on the tree. And as somebody interested in bears and really interested in um, animal sign and animal evidence, it's hard for me to judge the size of what I'm seeing. And so I'm just gonna give a, a, a hope that um, when people send in a picture, if you can put a frame of reference of size in your photograph, it could be your hand or if you have a pencil with you, not that many people hike around the woods with a pencil, but I, you always usually have your hand. So put your hand in the picture and that can give us a size thing. And what, what I would be looking at um, for a bear is something called a bear bite. And bears bite trees to mark them. And they bite, it's with their cheek teeth. So they turn their head to the side and kind of bite with their side cheek teeth. And that um, does a couple of things. It's a visual marker, but they also have scent glands inside their cheeks. So when they're biting it, they're not just leaving a visual marker, they're leaving that olfactory marker for other bears. And they're marking their territory, communicating other information, Nobody's really 100% sure what the bear bites are communicating to other bears, but they're used very often. And they're often put on softwood trees. So, you know, the fact that this was a pine tree, um, it, it's possible, you can see that's a pine, um, but it's hard for me to, to really make out the detail. And so I ask Eric, I have a suspicion that it isn't a bear bite, but perhaps something else. So Eric, what do you think? It's hard to know. It's like um, it's like you said, Susie, it would be good if there was more information. I mean, one thing you can see when, when you have a wide view shot is that there's no chips at the base of the tree, which is usually a tell for pileated woodpecker. If there's, if there's a significant infestation of, or, or um, yeah, well, I guess infestation of carpenter ants, which is the food source that the grubs of the carpenter ants that the pileated woodpecker is after, they're usually, telltale signs at the bottom of the tree. And they have, of course, those classic oval shaped holes that are very deep into the tree to get after the carpenter ant grubs. But, you know, it could, it could be early, early um, excavations of a, car, of a pileated woodpecker. It's hard to tell. I mean, clearly it's, it's a, um, it, the tree is rotten. Woodpeckers don't nest in rotten trees, generally speaking. So um, if it is a woodpecker, I suspect pileated going after the carpenter ant grubs. Well, I'm going to give Sue a little bit of homework and perhaps she's in the audience tonight. So Sue, here's a little bit of homework for you. Um, you can send in a picture with some scale to it. That would be great. You can use a, a little ruler if you want or your hand. And then also um, you can go back and take a look um, in the fall. So if it's a bear bite, it will mark its trees. It will bite the trees in the spring and the fall typically. So you can go back and look and, if, and oftentimes they remark trees so they'll bite them and they'll bite them regularly you can see this often on telephone poles so you can walk if you live on a dirt road or a quiet road walk up your road and look at the telephone poles and if they look like they have miles can you show that slide again with the marks if it looks like it looks like that take a good look and sometimes you can actually even find fur because they're very they're furry and um with the, especially with telephone poles, there's some creosote and they leave a little bit of fur. And if you can find some black horse fur, it's a bear. I will say 
it could be bear, especially since Sue has been seeing bear and um, that's you know possible. If it's pileated just getting started, Eric, Sue could go back and see if the holes have gotten any bigger, right? Yeah, yeah, so, for sure. So Sue, we're giving you homework tonight for Ask a Naturalist. <laughs> I hope you'll still continue to submit questions. We're not asking you to write an essay. All right, here comes our next question. I found this interesting bug on my chair on my deck today. Who would know what it, this is? I was pretty excited about the fluorescent antenna. This is from Karen from June 17th, 2022. And so this falls right into the sphere of Jenna. Um, and Jenna, did I forget to introduce you? No, you introduced, I've had a long day. You've introduced yourself. I know it's been a busy day, Susie, it's okay. Did you get to introduce yourself? I did, yeah. Okay, see? It's all good. It's all good. And even if I didn't, you know, we could just carry on. Um, yeah, so I was excited to see this because I love this insect also. Um, it doesn't have a common name, but we'll back up a little bit first and just put it in its um, taxonomic group, which is in the true bugs, which is in the group Hemiptera. So this is in the same group as, say, a stink bug. Um, even an aphid is in this group, depending on what taxonomist you talk to. But stink bugs are the most commonly known and also conifer seed bug bugs is another one that people often know. Um, this particular one falls into the subgroup of that called the leaf footed bugs. So these um, there, if, if we were able to zoom in on the picture, the back leg, the tibia of the back leg, so like its shin would have a, um, the exoskeleton is like really kind of wide and flat and it reminded somebody at some point of a leaf like foot. So there you have it, the leaf footed bug. So this guy um, or girl, I can't tell which because I don't know that much about any insect. Um, this one, its species name is Acanthocephala terminalis. Um, it has a couple of common names, but no one's agreed upon them. But I'll just tell you that two of them are clown bug and tip wilter. <laughs> don't know why, but there you have it. Um, and what these are is plant feeders. And I've never seen these become like, I mean, not that I'm a great gardener or anything, but um, I've never seen these become a problem in a garden or an orchard. I have spent a lot of time in orchards like other stink bugs can, but it does feed on plants in the same way. So these insects have um, the best name ever for their mouth part. It's called a rostrum, R-O-S-T-R-U-M for later, you know, maybe a quiz next time. And it's a piercing and sucking mouth part. So it will move it forward when it, when it wants to feed on, say, a stem, um, like a soft, juicier stem or a, a leaf or a fruit of some sort. Imagine it feeding on a tomato. It would, it would sort of move its rostrum forward and pierce the tomato skin. And then it has two channels in it. So like two straws side by side inside the rostrum down one straw is going to come the digestive juices into the tomato it'll digest those tomato cells into a real liquid form and then it'll slurp up the slurry we'll call it the slurry of tomato um, so you can see where this group of insects that are plant feeders could potentially damage your garden but this one i've never seen this one build up not to say couldn't build up in population enough that you would want to do away with it they have this beautiful bright ends of their antenna. I don't know why, and I don't know if it's related to their um, sex. I, I couldn't find anything on that when I was looking it up earlier, um, but they're just a really cool bug. If you see it again, Karen, I would just, one of my fun things to do, really, you know, have a little fun with the insect. I sometimes will give it like a half a grape, and then you can watch the mouth part swing forward. It's really tiny. It almost looks like on some of them, it almost looks as thin as a human hair. And you'll watch it swing forward and just like poke it into the grape and just sort of stand there and get its meal. It's fun. When I find stink bugs in my house, I do this too. Wow. Um, you know, I'm worried that people are going to, you know, leave here feeling like they've got to study and do homework, right? It's not school. It's just no. for you if you want to. No. So a rostrum, again, you want to just repeat that is what that is in case it's, it their, ma it's their mouth part. It's a piercing and sucking mouth part of a true bug. And just to be clear, not all true bugs are plant eaters. There are carnivorous true bugs. And those are like the assassin bugs. 
and they will stand on a flower and when a bee or a fly is coming to pollinate, they'll grab it and they have a much thicker rostrum and they'll stab in through the exoskeleton and the di same digestive juices come down and then they slurp up the slurry. So mm -hmm. this, there is like, if you take the group of true bugs, there's two, there's the carnivorous and then there's the herbivorous and this one is an herbivorous. Wow. Thank you so much, Jenna. The insect questions are always so fascinating um, with all different language and things to know. Aha. All right. Tonight we have a poll for you. So what I'm going to read this and then we're going to give you some choices to decide what you think it is and then we'll find out what it actually is. So recently observed these large, they're four to five inch diameter, dense prehistoric objects floating in the Quabog hope I said that right, river in Brookfield, Mass. What are they? And what are the perforated marks along the surface? Any value as wildlife food? This is from Pam from this July. So here's our questions for you. Ready to launch the poll, Miles, and you can vote. Okay, root question. Is it swamp thing, a dinosaur tail, spatter dock, daylilies, or duckweed? So just feel free to vote what you want. I'll just repeat them again, swamp thing, Dinosaur tail, spattered dock, daylilies, or duckweed. It's a lot of voting going on. It's very close. Looks like we might have a tie almost, right? We do. We have a tie. Um, sadly, it wasn't the dinosaur tail. Um, <laughs> it was the spatter dock is tied with the duckweed. So let's find out what it is. And um, we can see, I think we have Jeremy, you're here, right? You haven't had a chance to introduce yourself. I'm gonna tell us who you are and what, what this is that we're seeing. Hi everyone, Hi everyone. I'm, I'm Jeremy Wilson. I'm the director at the Harris Center. I usually answer questions related to trees, but Miles told me this morning that I need to answer a question about aquatic plants, which pushes me into to, to an arena that I'm, I'm not that familiar with. Anyway, this particular um, object, I was finding a lot of these in a, a several years ago in a, in a, um, at a beaver dam site where I was sort of battling the beavers to try and keep water levels lower. And uh, at one point they sort of ran out of, of sticks to put in the dam and they started bringing up these uh, dinosaur tails which are not really dinosaur tails. They're actually the rhizomes of spatter dock. And for those of you who don't know the term spatter dock, it's also, um, I think it's called cow lily sometimes. It's called yellow lily, it's called pond lily. So there's lots of different names and it's just something that's throughout this region you'll find on, on uh, shallow, in shallow waters. Um, it has that pretty yellow flower that comes up at, at, at one point. And they have these huge rhizomes that just grow as the plants age. Uh, under the water, they're mostly embedded in, in the murky soil down below, and there's rhizomes, uh, or there's there's adventitious roots that come out of them, and then also the 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 leaf, the leaves you'll see at the surface of the water also come out of these things. So it's 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 really the sort of central part of the plant that stays alive through the winter. And uh, I don't know about the. I'm going to stop sharing the. In terms of the, they were also asking about the perforated marks. There are these leaf scars and you can see those. So those are what leaves have come out of in, in, in past years. Um, I don't know about these perforations down a little lower that they're talking about. I, I'm not sure what caused those. And then I think there was a question about whether this was food. These are very, um, they're full of, they're very starchy. And so, um, Beavers can sometimes eat them. Muskrats eat them for sure. There's probably other wildlife that eat them and, and humans can eat them as well. I looked, I looked up, well, how are you supposed to prepare them? And you're, you need to take off the skin, the sort of outer, outer skin area. And then you, you grind it up and you can almost grind it into a flour-like consistency and then you boil it. And, and one person said, well, you need to to boil it and then replace the water three or four times because there's quite a bitter taste if you don't if you don't do that. So I'm not going to be using this to make my my meal tonight, um, just because the preparation sounds like a lot. But it, they definitely were used by by Native Americans as a as a as a source of starch. 
Wow, Jeremy, that was really good for somebody answering a question out of their expertise. I'm really impressed. Um, so thank you so much. And I know that I have seen um, the beavers feeding on this. I've, I've come across the parts. Um, but Jeremy, you said a word since I'm really focused on rostrum and, and uh, giving quizzes for next time and homework out. Did you say ad, what was that word you said like adventitious or something like that? Oh, I said adventitious roots. It's just it's just a way of talking about roots emerging from adventitious buds, and, and adventitious buds are just buds that uh, are are can come out of areas that don't have roots in them before. Let's put it that way. You can have adventitious buds that produce branches on a tree that come out of uh, a stem after the crown is has gone above that point, and and uh, so it's just a it's. It's not like the roots are, it's, it's buds below the surface of the object, in this case, the rhizome that can produce roots from different places on, on the rhizome. Let's put it that way. Wow, we're all learning tonight um, from adventitious to rostrum to spatter dock information that you can actually cook with it. This is good to know. Wow, thank you so much. That was so cool. And Pam, thanks so much for that question. And for all of you who answered our poll, let's see what our next question is. Saw this swallowtail on my marigolds the day after a wild and rainy weekend. It was so tattered and moving pretty slowly. Could it have been weather beaten? Or is this just the result of a run-in with a bird or other predators? Thanks, this is from Tony um, from this July 4th. 2022. And so Jenna, this seems like a question in your alleyway of, of entomology. What's up with this butterfly? Well, you know, like many of these questions, I wish I could just sort of like go back in time with this butterfly and follow it through the days preceding this, because I've often wondered what makes butterflies look so beaten. Um, so a couple of things about this particular, um, this is a tiger swallowtail. And this butterfly only lives as an adult for about two weeks. Um, and they're really very good at hiding from storms. Um, so I will, I've never ever seen any butterfly or moth out in a storm. Um, they really have a great sense of, you know, meteorology, I guess one could say. Um, so it's hard to know. I, I feel somewhat doubtful that it was the weather I feel more likely that it was probably an attempt at predation. Um, and that's only because, I mean, it's nothing to do with what it looks like. It's just to do with the fact that typically um, Lepidoptera are, Lepidoptera butterflies and moths, they're, they're fragile. Um, and so their behavior when a storm is coming is really to shelter, whether it's in a rotten log or under a bush. Um, so unless it was really surprised, I, I'm guessing this was not weather related. I'm guessing this was, some type of attempt at predation. It could, um, I was reading about attempted predation while they're sheltering in one just like, I, I didn't find like a full article, but it was sort of like often if a, if a insect will hide in a place from weather and then there's a predator inside because there are small mammals that will try and eat these guys. Um, as mostly it's birds that will try and um, feed on butterflies but often there will be small mammals involved as well. I did also find about a raccoon that went um, feeding on tiger swallowtails that someone wrote about. So my, my tendency is to think it was predation, um, but you know, I only wish we could go back and follow it for the two days prior to this, because really they don't, they don't live for very long. And usually when they die, they die in pretty perfect condition unless they've run into a predator, so. Wow, such a great, um, question. I, I just saw a tattered um, white admiral today and we had the same discussion. I was with a group of kids. So um, I can't wait to share your information with them, Jenna. So thank you so much. And Tony, thanks for snapping such a great picture. I'm pretty sure, Tony, that you have been studying butterflies with the Harris Center um, through this past winter into spring. And I know that um, if you've been in that butterfly class, we all are just paying so close attention to the, the butterflies. So can I just said one more thing, Susie. Oh, yeah. Because we're talking about new words. So lots of insects mouth parts are called proboscis. So the, the butterfly has a proboscis and the rostrum on the um, insect we saw before is a type of proboscis. So it's a subgroup. Wow. I didn't know that. There you have lots it. of good 
things for our, our polls and quizzes for next time. Fun fact, fun fact. Thank you. All right, let's see what's next. As we walked the trail around our beaver meadow this morning, we heard the American bittern for the first time this year. We also pondered again this plant that dominates the wetland meadow. Can you identify for it us? I've included a photo of a week or so ago when it was still more red than green, plus close-ups today of the greening leaves on the next slide. This is from Jim from May, 2022. Um, so you can kind of see it right there. And Miles, you wanna show the next slide where we get a, another view of it? So we're talking about kind of there. And I think this question is going to Karen Seaver. So Karen, who spends a lot of times along wetlands, what, what can you tell us about this plant? Well, Brett really figured this one out. So I'll give credit to her for this one. I wasn't sure it's, it, this, the pictures were a little tough for me. It's hard to see and it looks, um, Blue, it looked blueberry-ish to me and it's in the blueberry family. It's, it's in that broader family, but Brett was right that this is a type of leather leaf, which is a common name for a couple other plants out there. There's a viburnum that's called leather leaf viburnum. This is not that interestingly. This is a weird plant that I've probably walked by a lot, but it, you know, is unassuming in an interesting way. Uh, in its height, it's that it's a, sh it's called a dwarf shrub. Um, and I think one of the more interesting attributes that you can kind of see here are the flowers, and this is in May. So a flowering plant in May is pretty unique, especially, um, in this area. So probably, I'm not sure about pollinators visiting these flowers, but they're really cool. They grow on these like stalks and the plant term for that is this is a fun another another fun r word for tonight it's called a raceme r-a-c-e-m-e -E, i believe raceme there's probably other way british the british way of saying that too which i don't know what it is shrubbery and um and it's really interesting and this is like a a, a plant that can live in a bog so their roots are really interesting so to kind of tie in some of the things that Jeremy was talking about earlier in terms of rhizomes and adventitious roots, that's also happening with this plant. And um, an interesting attribute that I read about this plant is that it, it help, it's a habitat maker. So because of its unique ability to have these sort of lateral rhizomes, a rhizome is essentially an underground stem. It's not really a root. It's a, it's a, it's a, a root progenitor that is um, helping other plants grow in this area. So it's pretty neat. It's a neat, neat, now that I know what it is, it was really cool to read about it. And it's, uh, if we're talking scientific names, it's a mouthful. Chamidaphne calicolata. Whoa, I don't know where they come up with this stuff. <laughs> but another, um, Another common name for this plant that I thought was cool and maybe is a little bit, I don't know, cooler sounding than leather leaf. I didn't touch it. So maybe if Jim could touch it, or we go back there to see if it lives up to the leather name, but it's also called Cassandra, which is a cool, kind of has cool Greek feel to it. So that's what I know about leather leaf. I, and maybe I know Brett read a lot of things about leather leaf today too. So maybe she has some leather leaf tidbits to add. I think you, you covered it great. I don't have anything to yeah. add to that. Way to go. Wow. Yeah, we're really getting pushed to our, our, our knowledge here. So cool. All right, let's see. Let's move on from Leatherleaf. Thank you, Karen. That was great. And thanks, Jim, for sending in the question. Ooh, this is from Mira in this July. She says, I saw these leaves yesterday on a hike in Hollis, New Hampshire, and wondering what they are and what causes it. I know a leaf miner because it would love... I know the leaf miner causes it, but would love to learn more. Is there a live caterpillar in there or is this what's left behind? And wondering why the oak leaves are partially stripped to show the leaf skeleton. Jenna, you are on the hot seat tonight. Well, this Can one is hard too, because I, I literally saw this for about five seconds before I left the Harris Center and then never went back to it again. So you're not gonna get much from me today, but I'll give you the little bit that I know about this one. Um, there is a live insect in between the leaves of that, well, in between there. So you can see um, there, so just to, 
a quick thing about defoliators is that they come in all kinds of groups, of course, because we all like to put things in groups. There are those, and I forget the name of them, that eat between the two leaf surfaces, and that's what a leaf miner is. And then there are those that skeletonize, which eat everything but the vein. And then there are the whole leaf feeders that eat the whole leaf, everything. Um, and then there are those that roll the leaf, the leaf rollers. So, and more, you know, like so many categories. But this, um, the leaf miner, you can see at the very, where it's very tiny at the end, is where the female will come and lay the egg in between the two surfaces of the leaf. It's a super safe place to be, right? Because the little caterpillar, as it grows, just feeds in between the two surfaces and kills the tissue. And you can see as it gets bigger. So it's, it's starting and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then eventually it's going to pupate. Um, some of these pupate in between the leaf and some will come out and pupate. This one, it's hard to tell, but it kind of looks like maybe that, that, that last bit of the tunneling is maybe it was bigger for a pupa, I don't know. Um, you know who we need here though, I was telling Miles this when I first saw this, we need Sam Jaffe because he knows his leaf miners. Um, so that, one of the, my, my favorite facts about leaf mining caterpillars is that there are predators of them, of course, because everything has a predator and well, every insect anyway. Um, and they're typically a wasp and the wa it's a parasitic wasp. And one of them, there is one species of parasitic wasp that hones in on the dying tissue, like the, the scent of the dying tissue of the leaf and will walk, she'll walk up and down the, the little um, dead tissue area, smelling and feeling for the larva inside. And once she finds it, she'll position herself so that her ovipositor or egg laying um, device is right over the caterpillar and she'll push that ovipositor right into the larva and lay an egg inside it. So even though this is, seems like a super safe place to have your um, offspring grow up, um, there is still a predator that will find it in many cases. So that's all I know about leaf miners. I don't know what this specific one is though, I'm, I apologize. Wow, Jenna, you knew way more about leaf miners than I did. And I'm sure that many of us <laughs> in the audience did, so. <laughs> and then as for this one on the oak, I wonder if Jeremy might know more because um, a lot of forestry folks can identify pests um, if they are really damaging a valuable species. So I don't know, Jeremy, if you wanna weigh in on this, but that is some kind of insect that is skeletonizing the oak leaf. And that's about all I've got. Yeah, I, I have no idea, I'm sorry. That's okay. It's I figured very, I would ask. It's very cool to see the veins of the oak leaf so well uh, preserved in the. It's kind of amazing. I always think I've seen some jewelry made from skeletonized leaves like this, where somebody gets the whole leaf skeletonized and then dips it in some kind of metal. So maybe that's what Mira needs to do next for her, because um, I can't be helpful that all, all that helpful on this one. Thank you, though, and thanks, Jeremy, for 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 nothing. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for chiming in. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to Sam Jaffe, who um, Jenna mentioned. If you haven't come across Sam Jaffe and his amazing Caterpillar Lab, I'm hoping that Brett, maybe you could put that in the chat. Um, Caterpillar Lab is Sam Jaffe's kind of um, uh, organization that really celebrates the role of caterpillars and in the life of um, and, and their importance in ecology and it's he's fabulous if you ever have a chance to hear him speak. Um, I don't think I know anybody who's more passionate about caterpillars than Sam and he's also an amazing photographer so but just a shout out to that and thanks Jenna and Mira thank you so much for sending in those fabulous pictures and the questions and lots of great questions I love the curiosity of your um, of what you sent in. All right, I think it's time to turn the tables. So we have name this frog. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna show the frog and then you can put um, your answer in the chat. And we're gonna have Brett since the frog and she's our amphibian person, Brett's going to be the judge. So you can just put your answer in, put, Put, send it on in the chat, and then whoever's got the closest to the correct answer um, first will win a Harris Center gift. Are you ready? Turn the tables, let it go. There's lots of answers coming in and they're all mostly right, but there's one that is entirely right. And I think the first person to, to get it right is Andrea. This is a gray tree frog. 
Um, so Andrea, I think if you um, give a few um, message Miles with your email address, he can follow up with you about a Harris Center prize. Um, this, this frog is a really incredible frog. It's as its name suggests, it spends almost its entire life in trees. And so it's camouflage. It looks like bark. It eats insects that live in bark. Um, and it has really incredible uh, ability to change uh, its coloring to match its background. So sometimes it might appear more gray, sometimes more brown, sometimes more green. Um, and you can actually watch this happen. Uh, I had a friend who had some great tree frogs that they often will, they lay eggs in very um, shallow and often somewhat temporary bodies of water. And they, they seem to do this often in people's swimming pool covers where there's just puddling water. Uh, I get questions about that almost every year. People are wondering about the tadpoles that are living in their swimming pool cover and whether they can, um, or in their pool. Um, and so a friend of mine had that happen and he kind of raised some of the tadpoles for a little while into little frogs and then he would set them down on different colored backgrounds and watch as they changed to match what was behind them. So really cool. And one of the ways you can tell that it is a, a tree frog, if you look at the picture, you can see um, on the tips of its toes are toe pads, kind of like suction cups, and those are used for climbing. And so here in New Hampshire, where many of us are based, we have two uh, tree frog species. We've got this one, and then we've got the spring peeper, and they both have those little suction cup toes. But um, spring peepers have a much different coloring and uh, much different skin texture. So um, if a frog, if, in, if you're in New Hampshire and you find a frog that looks like bark, it's a pretty good chance it's a gray tree frog. So well done, Andrea, and many other folks. Can this frog change its location moving from tree to tree? For sure. They climb down out of the trees um, in order to migrate to wetlands to breed. Um, so they definitely, they don't stick to just one tree. Uh, they can move around quite a bit. And they have a very loud and insistent call that usually happens in May and June. And I don't know, Karen, if you want to share your gray tree frog story from um, last, was it last week, two weeks ago? I think you should. Sure. I would, I would love to. I wish, I wish the Keene State interns could be here to tell it themselves. Uh, but we were hanging out at the Harris Center at the Frog Pond, and it was a lovely summer evening, maybe a week and a half ago. And um, we heard some trilling. And um, like Brett said, they have a very persistent and distinctive call. And um, had five curious college students and they quickly found a number of these frogs. And there was one on the ledge. And of course, pictures or it didn't happen. We photographed it sitting there. And then, you know, you got a touch and feel. So we picked it up and um, and they handed it to me and then it promptly um, urinated on me in a very projectile way. Um, and it seemed to aim, it seemed to be a direct fire. And what made this, it's not the first animal that's peed on me surely, uh, but was most unique about this. And then I handed it to Mallory, another intern, and then it continued to do the same behavior on at, at her. And I didn't have my eyes closed when it was somebody else. And I saw the cloaca part and the liquid shoot out. Um, it was impressive. And it wasn't clear. It was it was milk. It wasn't milk, milk it was milky. It was not transparent. Um, so now I'm wondering, um, I, the, the many wondering many things, but one of the things I wonder is like, what is that? What was that? Is that just urine? What? Um, so yeah, it was an awesome moment. And, um, and this little frog, maybe we could post it somehow. It's like posed in the cutest way, like, like the way they turn their head. I find, I, I still love them, even though I had this interaction and it oddly made me love them more. They have such personality, but they're so cute. And uh, that was a fun one. So I definitely recommend if they keep trill, they keep trilling, go find them and pick them up. Just close your mouth. Thank you, Karen. Wow. Um, still mysteries abound. Um, even for people who are naturalists, we are always curious and discovering new things and, and witnessing new things that, and that's fascinating. All right, let's see what um, our next question is. 
or Brett, are you going to talk oh. about other New Hampshire frogs? Well, I will just um, a few of these were mentioned as people um, as guesses. So um, I think Bob guessed uh, wood frog, which we have up in this the top left there. That's um, just to note, people often confuse the names wood frog and tree frog because you think of the woods and you think of trees. Um, but wood frogs are not tree frogs, confusingly. They, um, you can look by their toes, they're really um, toes made for hopping. And so they're really uh, more frogs of the forest floor. Um, very common in New Hampshire, seen most often in spring during their nocturnal migrations. This time of year, the frog to the right there, the green frog, um, green frogs and bullfrogs are, are um, this time of year very commonly seen and heard. Um, and the one at the bottom was was one that is a is a really interesting and, and somewhat tricky frog to identify. This was a picture that was sent in from this past week by Lake Nubanusit. And uh, we have two frogs in New Hampshire that kind of look like this frog. Um, and so just a I get questions about this a lot from people who think they've seen leopard frogs, because you think of leopards and you think of spots, and this is a frog with spots. And um, the angle on this frog is pretty tricky. And um, I can't say 100% that it's not a leopard frog in this case, but most of the time when people send me um, pictures of spotted frogs from New Hampshire, they're not leopard frogs, they're pickerel frogs. And the big difference between pickerel frogs and leopard frogs is um, one of the differences is the shape of their spots. So le um, leopard frogs have very circular spots and they aren't necessarily um, um, organized in rows. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're just kind of haphazard um, positioning. And pickerel frogs have two rows of mostly rectangular spots and they're far more common in this part of New Hampshire. Um, leopard frogs in the Monadnock region have only been reported from two towns. So um, we threw that in there because it was submitted as, as um, and we were talking about what species it was. And in this case, uh, when you zoom in, those spots do look a little round uh, and a little less rectangular, and that's what threw me for a loop. And so we just thought it was a good example of that even, even the folks who spend a whole lot of time thinking about things like frogs or insects or mammal sign, um, sometimes even, even we uh, wonder about ID and it can be hard to tell. So I think that bottom one is a pickerel frog, but uh, I wouldn't say 100%. Thank you, Brett. So true. So well said too. All right. This is right to the point. Here's the picture. The wingspan is five inches. And would you recommend a moth ID guide, please? So I think Judith would like to know what this moth is. It's big. And she would like to know um, how she could find out more about moth identification. So Jenna, again, this is right in your alleyway. Oh, you're muted. Um, so this is one that I have not seen was uh, this was July 7th. This is interesting. Um, yeah, I don't have my moth guide with me. So does anyone have their like seek app? Cause here I am like looking at this. It's not a Cecropia moth. It's not the right, the right, um, shape and size. This was is a it last minute addition. So yeah, I, no time to prepare I was like, what? Yeah. Um, is it a polyphemus? Oh, I bet Jenna? it is a polyphemus. Yes. Let's see. Yeah, it is. Let's see. Um, wow. It's a male. I can tell you that. So this one has, see the really big fluffy antenna there? If you zoom in, hopefully we can see those. Those big fluffy antenna. Um, so it, for those of you that know me, you know that my ID on Lepidoptera is not excellent, as we've just noticed. But um, ecology wise, I love to think about them. So um, those really large, large antenna are feathery because the male needs to scent the female's pheromones to find her to mate. These also do not live for very long at all, probably less than a week, um, unless the weather is really cool because all insects are um, cold blooded. So they really, their lifespan is very much tied into the weather in most cases. So they have to find each other is the point. And so this, this male has developed a really large nose. So those antenna are his nose and he is going to find the female so that he can mate with her promptly. So that's how you can tell ID of any kind of moth that has um, 
not all moths are going to have this obvious difference between the sexes, but um, the polyphemus moth does, the cecropia does, the luna moth does. Um, yeah, so I don't have a great moth ID guide. I've actually been using the app on my phone, which is the Seek app or iNaturalist app for most of my IDs lately, um, insect and otherwise. So uh, does anyone else have a great moth ID book? in the crowd might be a good question for sam jeffy if you right? get in touch with the caterpillar lab you can yeah. you can um ask him that question any good id guide and i do want to say that a lot of the naturalists at the harris center um do use the seek app or the iNaturalist app and if that's not an app that you if you haven't don't have it on your phone i, I recommend it it's really fun and it's pretty interesting. Well, and the really helpful thing for me, because most um, Lepidoptera, unless they're a really common one, like the monarch or the black swallowtail, the caterpillars um, are not in many, it's just not, um, a lot of caterpillars look alike, I guess is what I'm saying. So if you're me, not Sam Jaffe. So, um, so and also there are some caterpillars that change with every time they molt, they look different. And I was shocked last summer when I went to ID two, what looked to me to be two different species and they were caterpillars right at the Harris Center. And my Seek app told me that they were two different instars of the same species. So these are really good. They've gotten these to be really fabulous. So I highly, um, highly recommend these apps if you are an app person. If not, it looks like Brett just put a great book um, suggestion in there. Fred, is that the David Wagner book? Yeah, that's the Wagner book. I know the cat. It's really designed for caterpillar ID, not for moth ID. But there are moth photos in there because it's all connected. But it's not gonna. Um, it's really geared towards towards the caterpillars, so it might not be exactly what Judith is looking for. But. That book is really interesting. It's about this thick, and it's just full of caterpillars and interesting information about caterpillars. It's a great book to have in your library. Um, one one last thing about if this was to, this was today, so um, clearly these are flying right now. If you are interested and you live in a place, it doesn't even have to be like super rural around here. You can leave your porch light on um, and see what comes to your porch light tonight. You never know what might be there in the morning. So these guys really do love coming to lights. Um, not sure that anyone really understands that very much still, but it would be amazing to see if these are out right now. To have one That's come great. to your light tonight. That's great. And I saw Mira put in a book um, that she saw when she was at a moth night with Sam Jaffe. So you can check out the chat for another suggestion. Oh, lovely. Thank you, Mira. Yay. All right. Let's see. I think this might be our last question, Miles. Is that correct? Aw, how cute. See the cute little fuzzy ones. We have, uh oh, sorry. My own canine is barking. We have a den of foxes in our neighborhood that I enjoy watching outside of their dens in the early evening. My question, can one tell whether each pup or kit is male or female by the color of their coat? There are four youngsters and their coats vary from light color to a rich, much darker reddish color. My theory, if this is possible, perhaps two female are sharing the same set of dens and the kits of one are older and richer in color than the lighter, less vigorous ones. These photos were all taken the same evening just a few days ago on June 25th, 2022. Well, um, let me first address if you can tell us um, the difference between um, gender or, or male or female by coloration in foxes. And the answer is no, there is no distinct color difference between the male or female. So when you and, and you can't really tell um, the difference. I mean, just by looking at them. And usually that's all we get is a fast glimpse of them. Um, so that's the first thing to know. Foxes do come in a variety of colors, red foxes do. They actually come in the very common red fox color that we're all familiar with, which is that beautiful um, red color with the dark feet and the dark tipped ears and the white tip to the tail. But they also come in a, a black color morph. That's just genetics. Um, just sort of like sometimes you see a black squirrel. It's just the genetics of um, mating pairs and, and the genes lining up. And so they might you might see a red fox that's going to be primarily very dark looking or black. Um, and one thing is they will typically have the white tip to the tail. 
you might see a silver variation of this where they'll look very silvery and not red at all either. And again, the white tip will remain. And then you might have what's known as a cross color, um, which is sort of silver in appearance with a black X on the back. Um, these are very, very uncommon. I think I've only, I've once saw a cross um, morph. And that's out of like 35 years of watching mammals. So really uncommon in this area. Typically what we see is the red coloration. Why we might have um, different colors and different sizes of young in a, in a den, um, that can be just um, genetics of, you know, big kind of like, think about if you have your own kids, um, sometimes you know, they get a recessive gene, they might be bigger or smaller. Um, so, and same with coloration. So that might just be some of the genetics and sizes. You might've all heard of runts of the litter. So a really small one might be the one that's just not getting fed as much or eating as much or didn't have as much room for nursing. All those types of things can lead into it. But one thing is true, foxes, although extremely territorial, particularly the females, sometimes um, female foxes will end up having to share a den, especially if there is very limited denning sites. And if that's the case, um, um, then you can see sort of mixed sizes. That's usually very unlikely. So my thinking is, Sue, so what you might be seeing is just a den with a male and a female raising their young of varying sizes, just based on kind of genetics and feeding opportunities. Um, but what I would be curious about is whether you see, um, you know, one male, or are you seeing three adults? foxes or just two adults. If you're seeing just consistently two adults, it's most likely just the male and the female. If you're seeing three adults, it could be something a little more complicated and that's a, maybe a blended family, who knows? So um, I hope I answered that question. I'm really aware of the time. It's just about time for us to wrap up. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight, sending in their questions, showing up to be curious about the natural world. I wanna thank everybody who was on the panel for all of their great answers and research. Um, and I want to encourage everybody to get outside. This is a great time of year to see incredible wildlife things. Anything you come across that's a mystery whether you photograph it, make sure you put some scale in it, um, whether you record an audio and you want to send it to us or even a video, we will be having our next um, uh, Ask a Naturalist this coming fall. And I know I'm going to put Brett right on the spot. Brett, what's the date? Because <laughs> September 29th. September 29th. That's um, so our fall edition. Yep. That's our fall edition. So please, we'd love to get your questions, send them to us. And thank you all this evening for showing up. It's been a real pleasure. Yay. Good night, everybody, and happy summer. Good night. Good night.